to show yourself approved. And so with this, um, Tony, Pastor Tony Evans resigning over a mega church in Texas, I thought this was the perfect live stream. I am going to live stream about crypto later, but I thought this was the perfect live stream to talk about the importance of having a relationship, a personal relationship with God for yourself and which you are in communication with and the, the importance of studying scripture for yourself, not just being read to, but cracking open or opening that book and you actually doing the reading as well. So I didn't do my live stream yesterday. The Tony Evan news came out today. And then uh, I'm on TikTok, right? I'm on TikTok. And I hear this pastor on TikTok say, say, say this. The pastor on TikTok said, uh, reference the scripture from Matthew. I think it's Matthew 22 and 14. And if I'm not right on this, this, but it's in the it's in the it's in the book, it's in the Bible. And the scripture that referenced many are called, but few are chosen. And so this pastor gave the example that he had three children, right? Two um girls and a boy. The boy is 32. The second um well, the first daughter is 18, the second daughter is 16. So the pastor give this reference that, you know, I want my um one of my children to carry out instructions for me. I want them to do something. He said, so I'm, I'm thinking about calling my 32 year old son to do this, but I'm thinking if I ask him to do it and give him the money to do this, he would just spend the money, you know, recklessly. So he said, so now I'm thinking about calling my second daughter, the 16 year old. And I feel like she will be responsible with the money, but she'll forget what I asked her to do. So I thought about calling her secondly. Um, the third thought process is to my first daughter, who is 18. And so I decided I'm going to call my first daughter because she's responsible and she won't spend the money and she won't forget. So I acted upon that thought and I called my first daughter to carry out this assignment for me, something I need done. And, it, and she was the one that was chosen. And I'm thinking, I don't agree with that example. I don't agree with that analogy. I do not agree with that scenario. I don't. The scripture, many are called, few are chosen. In fact, are chosen. In fact, gives an example of uh, persons that are invited for a wedding festival, right? Like a wedding party. And when they come to the party, their attire, their wardrobe, their clothing is not appropriate. So they were called, they were invited, but they were not chosen to participate in the party because once they uh, showed up, they were not party appropriate. They were not attire appropriate. Likewise, God calls many people to teach the Bible, to preach it. And many people answer their calling. I know sometimes we say, oh, God calls us and we don't hear. We don't hear the voice of the Lord and we don't answer the calling. No, many people answer the calling of preaching the Bible, right? Or being a pastor or an evangelist. Um, but they're not chosen by God. See, you can have a calling on your life to teach something. But God not choose you to do it because your attire, your clothing, your whatever, your flaw is not appropriate. And that's why I'm not in a church setting teaching, but I'm choosing to teach this way through social media. Right now, I'm not saying I'm not chosen by God. Right. I'm not saying that this, this is my preference. But many people who prefer to be in a church setting, who prefer to be in a pulpit, who prefer to go by titles, pastor, evangelist, bishop. God called them. He gave them a calling sometimes, sometimes to do that. And they accepted the calling, but he didn't show, he didn't choose them. Like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to call you. I'm going to place this in your heart and your mind, your desire but you got some flaws. You're not appropriate attire. You got some things you need to fix. So you're not my chosen one. And many people are still operating 
in that calling, but they're not chosen. So that's the way that I took this. Now, I'm, I'm going to get into the second part uh, that was on my mind yesterday. And this is the law of sowing and reaping. I can tell you as a PK, as a preacher's kid, the law of sowing and reaping. Again, you all come in, say hello, uh, hit the like, hit the share button. Has been taught absolutely the incorrect way. Have been taught absolutely the incorrect way uh, in churches over the years that I have attended. Now, if you are watching this live or on the replay, and you have ever given, let's look at Malachi, or let's revisit, or let's discuss Malachi chapter 3, the famous text that many is their go-to text on tithing. And in Malachi chapter 3, we see that um, this is, see, the back setting of this is not properly taught right the, the the setting of this what happened in malachi chapter three were the covenant the covenant of land was given by god right to that chosen group of people god blessed them with that land it's synonymous that you have land um, that you want to give to your children and you pass it on through your will or through your trust or whatever. And now your children inherit that land. They have the land. That was your covenant with them. That was the promise. And so you give them the land and you, and you tell them now, as a part of this covenant or contractual agreement, I want you 10% of your crops to give to the Levites, to give to the priests of the house. So that there may be food, there, be, there may be food in my house, meat in my house, right? Agriculture, crops. And when they inherit the land, they did not fulfill their part of the covenant or the agreement or the contractual obligation. They want to keep 100% of the crops of the harvest that they brought in. And God said, um, you're robbing me. You're robbing me. And they said, how are we robbing you? He said, you're robbing me. Will a man rob God? And they said, well, how are we robbing you? He said, you're not fulfilling your agreement. I gave you the land. You're not fulfilling your agreement to give the 10% to the Levites, to the house. And he said, if you don't fulfill your part of it, see, that, that debunks the teaching that you tied to get a blessing. No, no, no. Malachi chapter 3, they tied from the blessing they got the blessing first which was the land right they tied from the blessing not to get the land they tied from the land they got the land the covenant the contractual agreement between them and god they got that first and then they were told to tithe from the blessing not to get the blessing that's another thing miss talk and so he said so if you don't fulfill your, your covenant, contractual agreement, I'm going to cause your crops to be destroyed, your harvest. No rain. I'm going to shut the rain up. I'm not going to allow you to have a blessed crop. He said, but if you obey me, Put me to the test. Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. And see when I not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you will not have room enough to receive. He said, you know, if you don't tithe from the blessing I gave you, I'm going to shut the windows. You won't have any rain. You won't have any uh, crop. You won't have any food, right? But if you, if you, Obey me. Just put me to the test. Now, I'm going to ask this question. I want you all to be open, transparent, and honest with me. Again, whether you're watching this live or in the replay, how many of you all have tithed and gave a 10% and of your income and you've ever seen that you've had so much money to come behind that tithe that you didn't have room enough to receive? That the windows of heaven open up and you just didn't have enough, you didn't have enough 
limit on your bank account. You didn't have enough bank accounts to cover the amount of money, the influx, the inflow of money that came in. Latoya, thank you for tuning in and being honest. She said she's never done it. Well, let's let's break this down. And I'm gonna ask you all this question and I'm looking down because I'm referring to my notes. Um, what have you been taught about money in the Bible? There's over 2000 scriptures in the Bible when it comes to money, right? Um, Toya said, tithe and did make a little better TBH. I don't know what that means. To be honest, it made me a little better or did it make you a little bitter? Can you elaborate on, you know, what you mean by that for me? So let's, let's start off with Luke 6 and 38. Ooh, this is one that I have known for years to have been mistaught. Luke 6 and 38. Giving, but giving what? What does it mean to give what? Luke 6 and 38 says, But I say unto you, which here, love your enemies, do good to those or them that hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them. Ooh, pray for them that despitefully use you. Mm. So he said, made her bitter. Okay, okay, everybody else come in. Make a mind message connection. Pray for those that despitefully use you. And unto that smitty, right, or hit you on one cheek, take away that cheek and turn to every man and ask. Um, no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm talking about something. And unto him that smitteth thee on the one cheek, Offer also the other one. That means, okay, they slap you on one cheek. Then say, okay, here, you can have this side too. Slap me on that one. <laughs> right? Okay. Now, and the one that taken away the cloak, forbid not to take the, that coat also. Right? Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. As you would that men should do to you. As you would that men should do to you. You also should do unto them or do unto them likewise. For if you love them which love you. Right. What thank have you. If you just only love the people that love you, if you only like the people that like you, then are you, you know, a thankful? What thank would, would you have? And he said, for sinners also love those that love them. So what different would you be of a sinner if you only love people that love you? And if you do good to them which have done good to you, what thank you do you have? For sinners also do even the same. If you lend to them only to look, if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive. Isn't that something that you've been taught or maybe been taught in church though? Sow a seed to receive a need to receive something. But it's saying, look, look here in 6.38, that's not the way, that's not the model, that's not the law, that's not the blueprint. It says for... Sinners also lend to sinners and receive as much again. They say even sinners lend, lend to each other and they receive that much back. That means sinners are lend to each other and they, they will actually pay, the, pay it back or give it back, right? But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil be ye therefore merciful as your father is also merciful judge not that ye be not judged condemn not that ye be not condemned and you shall be forgiven now this one has been perfected by a lot of churches mm, and give and it shall be given unto you now they make it into money see we were talking about spiritual morals 
ethical morals earlier, turn the other cheek. Don't just do good to them. Just don't give to them that you know that you you will receive from or in hopes to receive from. They take this part right here, this section, and make it about money. Say, give and it shall be given unto you in good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. Shall men give unto your pockets, unto your bosom, for with the same measure you have met or meet, the same will be used to measure to you again. Now, how many of you all have given any amount of money and it has been given back to you, pressed down, shaking together, running over? Running over. Running over. Now, let me tell you this right here. Now, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait before I get into that. Now, Jesus or this scripture was talking about how to treat other people. This, this whole context is talking about how to treat other people, not about money, not about sowing and reaping. In fact, when you read Matthew 25, starting with verse 25, have you all ever thought of this? That the, the thing that it tells you not to do is bury money? So if, if we're talking about sowing money, why isn't Matthew 25 and 25 in alignment with that? Because when you sow a seed in the natural, right? I'm from Mississippi. My grandparents were farmers. When they sowed a seed, they had to bury that seed in dirt. Isn't that what the unproductive servant in Matthew 25 and 25 was cast into outer darkness in fact it, it seems like he was cast into hell on earth where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth because he hid his money the master's money in the ground in the dirt but yet we here in the church to sow and reap but to sow a seed you have to put it in the dirt in the ground in the ground which is exactly what matthew 25 and 25 teaches against let's go on right so Jesus said, how you treat people. How, so why would Luke 638 just change like this from how you treat people to now on finances? Because when you go into Matthew 7, the beginning of Matthew 7 starts off with judge, not that you be not judged, but with the what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And what measure, we see measure again, what measure you meet, it will be measured unto you again. But it is in direct relation to how we use judgment among each other. So if you read Luke in its context, you will have to conclude that Jesus was talking about the measure of treatment you give other people is the measure of treatment you will receive and return particularly judgment and forgiveness. You won't forgive somebody that had an out against you. You won't forgive somebody who did you wrong. You're judging people. And now when it's your time to need a measurement of forgiveness for a mistake that you made, you might not receive that because guess what? You didn't sow it. You didn't give it. When you need someone to understand you and you don't understand others, you might not receive that understanding. Why? Because you've never given it. When you need somebody to help you out of a tight spot or tight bind or to lend you money because you're in a hard financial situation, you might not get someone to lend you money and help you financially. Why? Because you don't help other people financially. Oh, that was good. That was good. No, that was great. I can't ever get somebody to help me with my bills. I can't, I, you know, in hard time. I'm, I, listen, this is a good one. I'm always there for other people and other people are not there for me because you're not there for other people. I love people, but people don't love me in return. When the Bible says it, if you want friends, you must first show yourself friendly. 
Listen, you can love one person or a person, and that person might not love you in return, but it does not mean that in return, you won't get somebody that'll love you just as hard or just as forgiving as you love that other person. You might not get it from that person, right? You might not get it from that person, but according to the law of giving and receiving biblically, you're going to get it from somebody. Now, I know some of you all are saying, well, queen, you know, the Bible said, whatsoever you sow that shall you also reap. Okay, we're going to go over there too. So Jesus in Luke 6 and 30, 38 is clearly talking about that whatever measure of judgment and forgiveness that you meet is going to be returned to you. It's not even remotely talking about money in no shape or form. This, this to say this is speaking about money is to take the scripture completely out of context and to make it say something that is not saying. So the danger of using scripture to solely apply it to finances or money, you all, is that you then don't pay attention to what Jesus said for the reason he said it. For example, or in essence, you ignore what Luke 6 and 38 is conveying. Christians are obsessed with easy ways to get money, but spend very little time building their personal character. Jesus, Luke 6 and 38 is addressing character issues. That's what he wants, or that's what that scripture wants you to pay attention to, not money. Character issues that completely over ignored. When you need forgiveness and then you don't get it because you don't give it away. When you need somebody to help you out of a tight spot and you don't get it because you don't give it away. When you don't return phone calls. And then when you really need somebody, you're, you're, you're calling and nobody answers and they don't return your call. This is what this was talking about. So let's let's go over this. First Corinthians 9, another one. Do I want to do that one real right here? Let's see, let's see, let's see. No, I'm not gonna I'm gonna say that one for later. Let's go to Second Corinthians, not first. Hmm. Let's go to Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians nine, right? Speaking of your heart, of the giver, right? Contextually, what was Second Corinthians talking about? Paul, thank you, Latoya. I need some more amens on this monday night live stream notice i didn't do it in my jeep so music won't distract me but i love music uh paul in second corinthians 9 is speaking of giving materially he is giving materially and financially in second corinthians 9 and 6. <laughs> and paul gives the assurance or affirmation that your harvest or your good investment into kingdom business, right, will come back to you, come back to you in response to the degree of your sowing. Second Corinthians 9, Paul wants to ensure the readiness of the church of Corinth to give materially and monetarily. This is about giving. Oh, don't don't log off. Don't log off. Well, Queen, I just you just said sowing and reaping in Malachi 3 was taught wrong in Luke 6 and 38. They have been, but Paul is talking to them that God will enable you to give by having made necessary provisions um, in these scriptures. And so let me read 2 Corinthians 9 to you. The collection for um, Christians and in, in the church of Jerusalem, let's, we hear this one a lot, a cheerful giver for God loves a cheerful giver god loves a cheerful giver right 
And so whoever sows sparingly, right, will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. How many of you all, whether you're watching this on the live and replay, have heard this taught in church? That if you give a little bit of money, you're going to reap a little bit in return. If you give a whole lot bountifully, you're going to reap a whole lot in return. And I've, I've had this talk to me in church city. And guess what? I have given $1,000 seeds. I have given $10,000 seeds. And guess what? I have been blessed with that in return. Oh, I know you was going to say. You thought I was going to say, see, nobody nobody ever gave me $1,000 back when I gave $1,000. I know you thought I was going to say no. I know I know you thought I was going to say, yeah, uh, I gave $10,000 and nobody gave me $10,000 back cash. Which I take that back because my parents, in fact, when I made my first uh, investment, uh, well, no, that it wasn't my first, but when I made another investment property in real estate, I had to have the cash, cold hard cash, and I had to send the, the cashier's check. And I needed my parents to make up for uh, like $10,000. And I told them I'd pay them back, but I didn't have the money right then and there to meet the deadline. And they loaned me that $10,000. Now, it was a loan because I gave it back. But I have given, because this was when I was taught about sowing seeds, $10,000 seeds. Now, they didn't give it to me, but they loaned it to me. Why? Because I've given it back to make that purchase. But it says each one must give as they have decided in their heart. See, this, this is where giving comes in. For God loves a cheerful giver and is able to make all grace bound to your account. He who supplies seed to the sower. Ooh, this one's really in the uh, prosperity teachings. Right. Seed to the, the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest. But see, this was left out of your righteousness. Didn't I say your harvest was going to be money? And then in the, in the good old prosperity teacher, quote, preacher, they would say, see, I'm good soul. I'm good soul. But see, in Malachi chapter 3, you all remember, God told the Hebrew Israelites when he gave them their land to sow into your own soil first. Paul is teaching here that when you give to kingdom business, you're going to reap spiritually. You're going to get a spiritual reward. When you invest your harvest, that the degree of your seed will equal or that the degree of your harvest comes in response to the degree of your sowing. Now, I know you're probably saying, well, Queen, does the Bible says, do not be marked, that whatsoever man sow, that shall he also reap. And if he sow of the flesh, or she sow of the flesh, they shall reap the corruption of the flesh. If they sow the spirit, they shall reap eternal life. That means that whatever you do, good or bad, you're going to have the consequences behind. It. Yeah. That's what sowing and reaping means in the Bible. That whatever you do, good or bad you are going to experience the consequences behind it that's what the principle of sowing and reaping from sowing is a metaphor for your actions or someone's actions and reaping is a metaphor for the results of those actions so if you want to drink alcohol and you overly abuse it you might have lung cancer. You might have health issue. You might be overweight. You might not be alert. You might not have a good quality of life because you're sowing of the flesh. So when you sow, 
it's a metaphor for your actions and reaping is a result of those actions biblically but if you sow of the spirit if you do spiritual things the nine fruits of the spirit joy peace kindness you might not sow to the people that you gave that to but you will see let me say it this way someone can be in your life for 20 years and treat you better than someone i mean someone can be in your life for two years and treat you better than someone who's been in your life for 20 years i promise you it might not came from the place you saw it and another thing me and my friend guy was talking about and i'm logging off was that people don't understand the work that it takes to reap a harvest anyway sometimes it's taught in the bible that we should not ask for god because the lord's prayer says our father know what we have need of before we ask before we even pray but that still does not say not to ask that does not say well i already know what you need so don't ask no my daughter asked me for things that i you know and i can know she needed but she's still going to ask look a four or five or six year old child they're gonna keep asking and they might not need, they might not even need that ice cream cone they might just want it but they're asking because they know you as the parent can provide it and are supplied to them when you ask god when you exercise matthew 7 and 7 and the lord's prayer say i know what you need before you even ask so when you start start the prayer like this our father which are in heaven he said don't even start the prayer asking me for stuff i already know what you need how about hollow and praise my name and give me some reverence and thanks first it's like the child that always come and asking you for things and never say thank you or never tell you how great of a parent you are you don't want to give that uh, ungrateful child what they ask for so god said you know you asked me but reverence my name first reverence that you know that i'm your source that i'm the person that can provide that for you a child does not ask a parent for something that they don't feel like that parent has the power to give them mama can i have this toy can i have this ice cream can i have they're gonna keep asking they don't even need it they reference you as the person as the parent they respect you that i know you can give me this if you decide to so i'm going to ask for it. and that's matthew 7 and 7 says ask and it shall be given that's a biblical command to ask it also says in james that some of you all have not because you ask not and let me say this and i'm not going to elaborate on this but prayer is both an art and a science some people don't know how to pray prayer is both an art and a science that means that you begging god to pay your rent is not prayer you begging god to pay your bills is not prayer you saying lord give me the wisdom to pay my bills that's prayer see when king solomon became the richest man biblically the richest king ever lived he didn't pray for money there's nowhere in the bible where people pray for money nowhere nowhere now second kings chapter four talks about a woman that's in debt she didn't pray for money she was like my husband serve you and if you don't give me a she prayed for a solution she told elijah alicia look if you don't solve this problem for for me uh my sons are going to be sold into slavery meaning they're going to have a job and have to work for somebody else and elijah or alicia however way you pronounce it said let me give you the solution and strategy to have your sons work for you in a home-based business and the woman became debt free and then he went on 
to the woman who was about to bake her last meal for her and her son and die. And he said, no, let me give you a strategy. Give, give me a piece first. Let me bless the small amount that you have. And this could be where sowing and reaping came from. However, I want you to see that she was talking to someone that had the ability to fix a money problem. You can't come on my live stream and say, I, didn't, I, I have gave, and I'm not talking about giving one time. It doesn't work anyway. Just give it one time. Um, I gave and I never got a return. Well, were you in alignment with someone that believes you should get a return? Not all pastors believe that you should receive something back when you give. Oh, I can lay back right there. See, when I started giving and I started getting blessed financially, I was giving to pastors who were in alignment. I said, I want to be a millionaire, a thousandaire, a multimillionaire. I want to be an investor. I want to be like the Proverbs 31st woman. What pastor can I give to that believes in it? And for me, to start my journey, it was Leroy Thompson. It was Creflo Dollar. You, 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 you might not believe in them or not, but I did. And I believe that when they said the word of God's uh, scriptures of prosperity over the money I gave, that I was going to be prosperous. See, Paul and Silas had this alignment. Thank you for the balloons. I love that. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Paul and Silas had this alignment. Paul said, I planted it. Silas watered, or it could have been vice versa, but it was God see, that gave the increase. And when I gave and I became in alignment with people that believe scriptures like the blessing of the Lord make you rich and add no sorrow, with people that believe uh, in Genesis that said Abraham was very rich and it was not talking about spiritual riches, it was talking about material wealth and livestock, land, gold, silver. When I got into alignment with people that was in agreement with Deuteronomy and said, I will give you houses with the S you did not build. When I got into alignment that believe people that were pastors that believe in Deuteronomy 111, may the Lord thy God, the God of our ancestors bless you and increase me a thousand times more. See, once I got in alignment and then I took action Right. Let's let's go back. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about these these A's, these four A's. Matthew 77 says you first must ask. You have to ask first. Ask for financial freedom. Ask for a solution. Ask for a strategy. Ask for God to show you who you're supposed to be in alignment with concerning money and wealth. Because there's over 2000 scriptures in the Bible. More than prayer of faith. Prayer and faith that talks about money and money management. God, who should I be in alignment with? First of all, you don't be in alignment with anybody that doesn't believe. It's not God's will. When there's so many rich and wealthy people in the Bible to prove that to, for you to be rich and wealthy. Job lost everything he had. And God blessed them back with double material and spiritual wealth. Queen Esther, Queen of Sheba queen of Ethiopia, King Solomon, Abraham, Lot. So many rich and wealthy patriots in the Bible for people to say, God wants you broke. Paul was a tent maker, a businessman. Luke, the physician, high income earning people. Matthew was a tax collector for you all that don't like to pay your taxes. And, you know, and Jesus hung, hung around Matthew and his friends that the Bible referred to as sinners. Jesus run a, hung around wealthy women. So you hear about the poor Lazarus that died in the Bible, but you don't hear about the rich man like Lazarus in the Bible that was Jesus' best friend. In fact, a rich woman financed Jesus' funeral. In fact, the alabaster box, Mary, Martha, Lazarus' sisters came from there. They, these was rich, rich people. Rich people in the Bible. So many 
gold and silver and land. In fact, so, so much times in the Old Testament when they went to build the tabernacle, David lived in the palace. I had to tell the people to stop giving. The people gave so much gold. And uh, we got Lydia, the, the seller of purple linen. So why we talk about poverty more in the Bible than we do prosperity? So you got to be in alignment of who you give to. Then you have you have to ask. You have to be in alignment. And then you have to take action. See, knocking is action oriented, right? Ask, see, knock, take action. Most people don't take action. You don't take the action you need to receive your harvest. You don't. Your harvest may come through crypto investing and compound interest, but you don't have your money in crypto. Your harvest may come from stocks and dividend investing, but you don't have your money in stocks. Your money may come from investing in real estate, but you won't get the required knowledge. See, that's what most people don't want to do. Again, my, my grandparents were farmers from Mississippi. It took just as much hard work and discipline and knowledge to get the harvest, probably more to, than it was to sow the crop. See, sowing the crop, you had to know the right season. You had to break down, uh, break the land into, right? Get the land prepared, the soil prepared. You might have to put some fertilizer. My cousin from Mississippi said, get some triple eight fertilizer. So you have to prep that soil. That's what we're talking about. Those, your heart has to be right. Because God loves a cheerful giver. So bountifully, reap bountifully. Don't give out of grudge or necessity. What's your attitude when you're sowing? Are you happy? See, money does not buy happiness. But happiness brings money. Let me say that again. <clears throat> this is true. Money does not buy you happiness. It won't make you happy. But money, happiness brings money. If you have a waiter or a waitress that's serving you food and they have a happy attitude, you just want to give them a good tip, don't you? You want to give them the best tip. They serve, I hope you do. They serve you well. People that's, that's joyous and happy, that stay around you, you, are, you don't mind giving to them, lending to them if they come across hard times. Why? Because they have a, a joyous spirit and attitude. They're not mean and grouchy and talk to you grudgingly all the time. See, money does not buy happiness, but happiness brings money. It does. It does. People do not mind giving to happy, joyful people so you have to be in alignment you have to act and you have to be action oriented you have to take action and you have to i said four a's acquire knowledge on how to harvest see the method my grandparents used to harvest the crop was not the same method that they used to sow the seed they had two different tools Two different skill sets. In fact, they had to protect the seed once they sowed it. Sometimes they planted a scarecrow, right? A scarecrow to scare away the birds that would eat the seeds. And then they had to protect the seed from the scorching sun. They had to hope that it rained, that the conditions, right, would present themselves. This is where we get Malachi 3 from. Open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. The winners of heaven over represented rain coming down from the clouds from heaven, right? And it will bless the crops. God said, I'll bless your crops. I'll cause conditions in nature to bless it. And then they have to keep the weeds out, right? And then they had to know, they had to have discipline. They had to get up every day. They didn't just plant a seed and now, oh, man, I'm chilling. I'm good. I'm going to get a harvest. I, I'm planting the seed. I'm, I'm expecting this unexpected blessing. No. They were expecting a harvest because they got up and worked every day towards getting the harvest. 
Oh, ooh, that was good. That was great too. They could expect the harvest because they got up and did the work every day to get a harvest. You just don't sow a seed and say, oh, the work is done. No. Oh, I'm gonna get a I'm gonna I'm gonna sit by the mailbox. I'm gonna get an unexpected check in the mail. Bills paid off. You see if your bills get paid off if you don't pay the bill and collect on time and you don't want to go to work. I saw this joke one time that was written on the wall that says, um, this person said, I want to go on a vacation. Where should I go? And the bank, their bank account responded to them and said, to work. All right, you don't have the money to vacation. It takes discipline to get the harvest. It takes knowledge. When you're harvesting a large crop, you got to have different equipment. If you want to get that crop, crop in time, harvest before it dies out. So that means you got to have knowledge base and you have a different skill set. Your harvest may not come in the same manner in which you sowed it. Just same thing I said about your character. The people you love, they might hate you. You might love your, your husband or your spouse or whatever to the end of the world. And they, they don't show you love in return. It may not come from them. It will come some, through somebody somewhere at some appointed time. It's good to have it come to that person, but it might not come to that person. The same thing with your finances. So am I trying to discourage you from giving? No, I'm just teaching you the truth about the law of sowing and reaping as it should be taught and tithing in the Bible. Now, I'm, I'm going to end on this. I said that praying is both an art and a science. So what do I mean by that? Queen, most people don't know how to pray. Science is uh, it seeks to understand something. Science seeks to understand how to pray, right? Through rigorous observation, right? I'm seeking to through experimentation. Art explores through emotion and experiences. So when you pray, you use past experience, yours or others that have worked, and ask them, how did you pray for that? How did that come about? And you learn that. That's the art part of it. You do what they did to get what they got. The science is through observation. Many people don't believe, for example, in affirmations. I believe in affirmations because I believe in affirmations that people have said and done in meditation. Matter of fact, Joshua says, if you meditate on my word day and night, you will have good success. Most people don't meditate. They don't get a, in a state of quietness. You know, God said, my voice is a still, small voice. People don't listen they talk more than they listen for the voice of God, for instructions. Right? And so it's a science and an art. It's knowing what to say, how to say it, and in each particular situation. It's different. There's nowhere in the Bible where you pray for money. You pray for knowledge. You pray for strategy. You pray for a solution. In fact, King Solomon says, Lord, give me the wisdom and knowledge of how, how to direct or lead your people. Give me leadership skills. And as a result, God visited him. King Solomon presented a burnt offering to the Lord and God made visit him and made him the richest king ever recorded biblically, richest person ever recorded biblically. But that's Queen Sheba was rich too. We don't know how she accumulated her riches, right? So Solomon didn't pray for money. He prayed for wisdom and knowledge. Likewise, you should too. Another reason, and we're talking about giving, and I'm 
on here way longer than what I intended, almost an hour, that people do not receive their harvest in return when they do give money, not sow it, right? Matthew 25 says we should not bury our money in the, in the, in the uh, ground. But 1 Corinthians 9 says, if we have sown the good seed of spiritual things in you, isn't it our right? Shouldn't we receive your material things? See, I talked about being in alignment. You all will hear me or other people talk about prosperity. Talk about my levels. Talk about that I have given to people that are more, that were more prosperous than me. And because they were in agreement, that's another A we can add. Acquire knowledge, we can make a five. Alignment and agreement. That I did get a harvest or I did get a return back in multiple thousands. But it didn't come back in cash. It came back in my knowledge, information, and taking action. I said action, take action. In the investment world, Matthew 25 breaks that down as well. That the, the one that received five talents, five gold, bags of gold, went and traded immediately, immediately. Then the other received two. It just said he went and traded. Trading is a financial skill set. The one that received one bag of talent went in here and dug it in the, in the ground. That's why sowing and reaping money is not biblical. But you don't give to, to people that teach you about finance. And so your the information, the knowledge, the action that it takes, you never possess that because you never give to the people or me for example, that's teaching you how to do it. You just want to take, see, we talked about earlier, Luke 6 and 38, talking about the character of people. People that just want to take something from someone that's helping them knowledge-wise, but never want to give back. And you wonder why your seed or your giving, you never get a return because you're giving to the wrong people. You're not giving to people that's in agreement and alignment or you're not giving at all and they are giving to you. So let me finish reading 1 Corinthians chapter 9. They're giving you spiritual. And I, I do, uh, I my purpose on this earth is more about material blessings. If you don't like, if you don't want to be rich, if you don't want financial freedom, if you don't want financial independence, I'm not the person for you to follow. If you just want to die, pay bills, work, and in the afterlife, figure out which heaven you're going to go to, because the Bible talks about at least three heavens, right? And, and try to figure out which heaven you're going to go to. When in Genesis tells us that we are to subdue, multiply, have dominion over earth. When scripture says the highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth that I have given unto mankind, when we're supposed to have dominion on this earth. Right. When Genesis 8 said Abraham was very rich and when talking about spiritual riches. But if you don't want that on in this life, you're finding the wrong person. That's not me. And so goes on, 1 Corinthians 9. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I not, this is from Paul. If I be not an apostle unto uh, apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. The seal of mine apostleship are in the Lord. My answer to them that examine me is this. Have you not power to eat and drink? Right? And then it goes on to say, for it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle, muzzle the mouth of an ox or tread it out of the corn. But don't God still take care of the oxen and set it all together for our sakes, right? It is written that he that plows should plow in hope and he that threshes in hope should be a partaker of his hope. If I have sown unto you, if I have given you spiritual things, shouldn't I reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are we not in partnership or are we not rather? 
You don't give to the people that give to you. I'm talking about, and look, I, I know I help people make money in crypto just, just by showing up and sowing my time and my talent, my knowledge. The people that give back for that. Um, she's not on my live stream. Gwen, for example, right? She came on the last time I live streamed. I think it was Sunday. I was singing in my Jeep, you know, singing in my Jeep, singing in my Jeep. But Gwen gave this testimony, for example, her, um, Gwen was a faithful giver. She was. And her mother had a seizure. And Gwen would give whenever she desired to, right? Gave from her heart, not a tent, whatever she wanted, $111, right? Her mother got sick, had a seizure, and was in room 111. She said when she saw that room number, she had peace. And her mother walked out to the hospital that, you know, on that health occurrence. Uh, people that had given 111 or whatever, 1,011, 1111, have told me I acquired exactly 11 acres of land that I didn't know I was going to get. My aunt, his name was... Uh, Gosh, forgot his name. I've, uh, aunt passed away, left it in, in, in the um, exactly 11 acres, left it in her will. People that tell me I've got contractual agreements on the 11th of the month. You know, just things like that from giving 11, 11, 111, 1,011, whatever. So I'm saying this, and I'm closing. When you don't feed what's feeding you, See, that's, that was the whole principle of the woman that was going to bake her meal and die. Right? Let me let me go to that scripture. And feed her son and die. And the prophet Elijah, Elisha said, um, 1 Kings 17 and 12, as surely as the Lord God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. I just have a handful of flour and a jar of oil and a little oil and a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son so we may eat it and die. Now, some people will look at this and say, now, uh, I, th I think I said Elijah. I'm sorry. Elijah. Elijah. Now, some people will look at this and say, now, Elijah took. Ask this woman for some, Elijah was not hungry. He had just left the creek, right? He had just left the creek and where God was using the ravens to feed him and bring a bed, bread and the water he was drinking for, in the creek for waters. He was not hungry. But he, he gave her, he, he said, look, you are operating in fear. So let me take away your fear. See, what giving does is it does not give you a scarcity mindset. It gets you from operating in fear. Well, this is all I got. All I got is this little bit of money. Now, I'm not telling you to mismanage your money. I'm not telling you to give to sow your rent or mortgage bill. That's your bread anyway. That's not your seed. And hope God makes a miracle. God does perform miracles. But you can't mismanage your money and want God to make up for that. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Nope. Not how it works. This is not how prayer works. This lady had survived through a famine and she had got to her last meal, the last little bit she had in her house. Elijah, 2 Kings chapter 4, he asked her, what do you have in your house? She said, I just have a little bit. That's all, all you need is a little bit. One thing I do agree with that a seed will meet needs bigger needs it takes away that scarcity mindset asking takes away of not acknowledging god as your provider and your source that's why you ask you ask because god is your source you don't ask to beg and plead for something that you're not able to manage anyway you ask as recognition that god is your source god give me the wisdom give me the knowledge Give me the connection, the alignment, the agreement of person. So I can attain financial freedom. I just went, I just, I wasn't vague with God. I just went ahead and said, hey, I want to be a multimillionaire now. 
You show me what it's like to be a millionaire. I want to be a multi-millionaire now. Like I'm, I'm getting more specific. Why? Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And all that dwell within, the Bible says, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. Imagine if I own a cattle on a thousand hills. I would definitely be a multimillionaire. Come on now. Our God is not a poor God. So why should you be a poor person? You don't serve, you serve a king. Why should you be poor if your parents are rich? That's the whole story concept of the prodigal son. Like you're living in this rich environment. All your needs are met. Why would you go out there and, and mismanage your money and your future and, 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 and now live amongst the pigs and the swine and go and succumb to poverty? But anyway. So Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Go and take and do what I have said. He had to, she had to give so that fear can go away. You have to understand that money will always come back to you, circulate back to you with the joy and the happiness that you circulated it out. Money is a currency. Cash is a currency like water, like electricity. When you don't give it and you stop the circulation, when you don't invest it and you stop the circulation and the growth of money, you will not get more money. Has nothing to do with sowing and reaping. When you don't give it to people that you're in alignment with and agreement with, when you don't invest it, the Bible talk about investing. I won't go into that. Or should I? Um, it's, it's over an hour anyway. Genesis 47. I'm going to read this. So when the money fell in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, give us bread for why should we die in your presence? For the money has failed. Genesis 47, 15. You all, I'm telling you all, I will have to get up and go get my cash. This cash system is about to fail. Mm -hmm. This cash system is about to, to sell. I mean, fail. It's about to fail. The cash fiat system. And crypto is going to be the new financial system. I'm just telling you. So if you want to ask me, well, Queen, where is the Bible talking about investing? Okay, we'll do this. Matthew 13 and 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. When a man found it, he hid it again. See, he found a treasure, found something of value, hid it again. And then in his joy, money might not make you happy, but according to the Bible, it sure will make you give you joy. Just when I say the word, it forces a smile. See, money, just the E of money forces you to smile, right? And he said, and then he went into the uh, his joy and sold all he had and bought that field. This is investing principles. You find something of value, right? And then you hide it again. You don't spend it. And then in his joy, he sold it. He went into commerce. See, money has to grow not only in the hands of a person that's in agreement, alignment with you, but also in the marketplace. The treasure of the field. The treasure hidden in that scripture means that is not yet revealed to everyone. Most people are not going to understand crypto until it just it just comes into fruition. They just not, they just gonna be afraid. They're gonna operate out of fear. Elijah had to tell the lady in First Kings, do not be afraid. Go and do like I tell you to do. And in order for you not to be afraid, you're gonna have to give to me something. Right? Here's another one: the parable of the pearl of the great price. Again, 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 the kingdom is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who then 
had found one of the pearl of great price of value and sold. You won't believe how many people tell me, I don't like selling. I don't like selling. You know how much money is made in commission sales? How many Christians say, I don't like to sell people? How many Christians have been a part of network marketing? I don't like selling. <clears throat> My family going to ask me, and this is another one, no scam again. You know what a scam is? Working 40 plus hours a week and you're still broke. <coughs> yeah. Um, what do I think about the stock split? I haven't looked at the stock split. Selling is in the Bible. Solomon sold his wisdom. For the people that say 66 is evil, but 666 ounces annually of gold, people came and listened to the wisdom and knowledge of Solomon. They pay for his wisdom and knowledge. See, a lot of you are, you don't want to invest in wisdom and knowledge. You just want to come on here and ask me questions and get that information for free. See, that's the law of giving and receiving. You want me to give you something so you can receive to benefit you, that you don't give anything to me. And there's nothing wrong with asking questions. But see, this is why a lot of people's seed get scorched by sun they don't water their seed they don't give they don't water their giving they don't give their money to anybody that's gonna water it for them on their behalf and people that tell you it's good soil they're really not good soil because they don't know how to grow their own money so how are they going to grow yours how are you going to give to a pastor or a person that tells you they're good soil and to sow unto them and they don't grow their own money. They're not responsible for their own money. I gave someone, and I'm not going to say every time I gave that I was blessed through my investments. I gave someone thousands one time, and they went out and bought them a new BMW. A new BMW. I never gave it to that person again. That was a lesson learned for me. You're not going to buy a BMW with my hard-earned money now if they would have invested and grew their money and then came and told me what they invested in to grow mine see that's the law of alignment and agreement elijah and elijah gave both of those women strategies and solutions to get out of their poverty situation and the reason why the woman had to give a little bit of her flower first to Elijah is because she had to drive fear out of her life. Giving takes away fear. I used to have, I would have people um, that give to me make these affirmations. Because my giving is my first step in receiving, my giving makes me rich. You have to drive out scarcity. You have to ask God through an art and science way of praying. And when you pray, you have to act upon it. You have to believe it. You have to vision it. You have to envision yourself. You have to want it. Asking is a first step in wanting something. That's why your little kids, that's why your nieces, your nephews ask you for things that they know you can provide. It's not because they don't have faith that you can't give it to them. They know you can give it to them. That's why they're asking. And they're asking demonstrates their faith in you. And God, Matthew 7 and 7 says, first, you got to ask. You got to demonstrate your faith in me. I have need of, I know what you need before you even pray, before you even ask. So hollow my name first. Let me know that you reverence me as your source and you know that I can provide each and every one of your needs according to, according to my riches and glory. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, we.
We got a guy of infinite sources. But you have to be the resource. You have to know how to harvest. You know how you have you have to know how to act. You have to know who's your prosperity department, our partner, white right? Paul and Silas. I planted one one planet, one water. God gave the increase. You have to know who to give to. And you have to know when to give and when to invest. You got to know when to hold them and you got to know when to fold them. I'm logging off you all. Love you all. Love you all. Love you all. If you're just coming in, uh, I've really talked about the law of sowing well and reaping and how it's mistaught in the Bible. I mean, mistaught from a biblical perspective, but how giving and investing is taught in the Bible. And those are the only two laws and principles that will grow your money. Not sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping is a spiritual, more of a spiritual and a character building thing, right? So if you want to know about that, go back. I talked very little about Tony Evans and his resignation. Uh, but I listened to him over the years and I pray that he has peace in his decision. I heard that last year, or I read somewhere st statistically, that over 3,000 pastors resigned um, in 20, because of the stress, right? And, and out of the 3,000, approximately 275 committed suicide. There are some good pastors out there. There are some pastors who give their last. There are some pastors who have good intentions. Not all pastors can teach on prosperity. Not all pastors can help you grow your money. But they may help you spiritual wise. They may help you character wise. And believe you me, you need that as well. You need that as well. You need all of it. Don't be rich spiritually and poor materially. And don't be rich materially and poor spiritually. That's the whole story of the poor Lazarus. Right? There's And the rich man Lazarus was Jesus' best friend. I'm logging off for the fifth time. I love you all. Make sure that you are subscribed to me and I will research this stock uh, and maybe I will live stream about it. I will look at the stock. Uh, I have been looking at more of AI stocks, but specifically um, cryptocurrency, AIs, having a well-diversified crypto portfolio. Queen out.